Psalm chapter 84 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 84 and verse 1. It's a psalm. It's one of 11 psalms that's written to the sons of Korah, to the chief musician upon Githith, it says. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even feigneth for the courts of the Lord. Anybody come hungry this morning for something the world can't supply? Anybody realize that Sunday was just your day? This is your day. Because God's got what you need in the room this morning. You couldn't find it at Walmart. My soul longeth, yea, even feigneth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, for she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart, in whose heart are the ways of them who, passing through the valley of Baca, it tells us that there is a mentality that we can adopt, a mindset that we can internalize and that we can put to work in our lives, whose in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca there's something that they do in a challenging season we know that val the valley of Baca was a valley of weeping it's a season of sorrow it's a time of trouble it says that but when they pass through the valley of Baca they make it a well the rain also filleth the pools they go from strength to strength every one of them in Zion appeareth before God O Lord of hosts hear my prayer give ear O God of Jacob Selah behold our God is our shield and look upon the face of thine anointed someone say that's me for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness for the Lord God is a sun and a shield the Lord will give grace and glory no good thing the problem is our identity of good is often cued by what the world would say is the thing we want. But God has good things stored in the seasons of sorrow and the time of trouble. There's good things there, but sometimes you just got to dig it out. But no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. We have this opportunity for the next few moments to let the word, that infallible, powerful word, speak into our lives. And I'm wondering if anybody would just say, God, would you let it speak to me this morning? Would you just let that be your prayer for a moment? Could we lift our hands? Because there's something very powerful that God wants to do in somebody's life this morning. Father, we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory because you alone are worthy in this room today you've prepared opportunity you've prepared a place for us God you've planned and ordained this moment that we have together and God somebody came with hunger today that the world cannot fill somebody came with desire they haven't really identified it particularly but God in this room there is a refreshing that has come and God, there is a hunger that's being satisfied by simply being in your presence. I pray, God, that you would allow someone to recognize that you fill that void. God, that that hunger is being met because your presence is here to help these people today. We give you praise because you're worthy. Would someone just speak his name in Jesus' name? In Jesus' name, you may be seated this morning. We're all filled with a natural hunger, and uh, I'd say maybe some of us more than others, and, and some of us are, are blessed with a different set of metabolism. I, I can think of different people in the room. Rick, Rick Larley is one that, that I would think about. He, he's able to just to eat a whole bunch of stuff, and it never seems to attach itself to him. But there's times, you know, there's, there's, yesterday was kind of one of those days where this, <clears throat> the snow was melting, and the, the driveway that has been layered and layered with sand and salt and so, sand and salt has, it was, uh, I was trying to ignore it. It was kind of calling my name to go out and scrape it all off the driveway. And I ignored it until the afternoon. And the more I looked, I thought, you know what? I can get the rest of that off if I go and I hit it with a shovel. And so 
I went out, and, and it was just one of those days. And, and before long, I, I realized that I'd kind of, for the most part, I'd, I'd skip breakfast, and then for the most part, I hadn't had a whole lot for lunch. And by the time it got to supper time, it was church time, and we were here for prayer meeting. And, and so I, I came to prayer. By the, by the end of service last night, I, I'll, I'll just use the word that I hear thrown around the household sometimes. I, I was snacky. I'm just snacky. I don't... I didn't know what was going to really fill the void. I, 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 I was hungry for something. And so we finished prayer meeting. And, uh, and Kathy had, had a, a, another meeting following service. And I was kind of waiting around for that. And, and finally, said, Sister Be she said, well, Sister Beverly can, can bring me home. I said, perfect. And I left. And at the end, down the street, I hung a right. And I went to the Irving. <laughs> and some of you, I know you're hungry. It's only half hour from lunch. And maybe you skip breakfast. So you're a little snacky. <laughs> you're hangry cross between hungry and angry. I didn't know that that wasn't a common term. We, we throw it around so much at the house that it's just vernacular now. And I went, I went to the Irving. I, got, I didn't get like this 60 gram bag. I got the 200 gram bag of 200 gram bag of barbecue Humpty Dumpty What do they call them now? Old Dutch? Can we just go back to Humpty Dumpty? I got a 200 gram bag and man, I didn't even stop there. I swung around over into the refrigerated section. I got some dill pickle dip. No excuse. And whatever was in the cupboards didn't matter. Whatever leftovers may have been in the fridge didn't care. Because I knew that there was just, I hadn't had that in so long. And I just, I'm just going to tell you, I don't do that every Saturday night after prayer. As a matter of fact, I, I just leave the groceries up to Kathy. There's always good food in the house. But that's what I was hungry for. There's sometimes there's just, you know what you're hungry for. And, and until you get that, you know, it's about that time right now that I'm, I'm about due for a good feed of turkey. <laughs> January, February, yeah, three months. I'm like a 20 pound turkey with gravy and dad's homemade cranberry jelly. We call it cranberry because it's got so much. I'm, I'm about due for that. I, I, I'm hungry. I know I'm hungry for that. Kathy's taking notes. And... <laughs> so you just kind of know what you're hungry for. Well, can I just tell you that your internal spiritual man has a hunger that it's very specific in, in, in its ability to identify the need. When you come into the house of God, can I, can I just remind someone that you got what you needed when you came into the room this morning because that fresh presence of God that was here satisfied a need that is inside of your spirit. A need that was on the inside of you was hungering for something and, and you realize that when the people of God began to praise and, and, it, and it can come through prayer, personal prayer and it can come through personal reading of the word of God but there's something about it when we gather together with the people of God. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts, my soul longeth, yet even fainted for the course. Someone identified with that verse because it's not just a, a black ink on some white paper. It's a reality in your life. There is something inside of you that you know you're hungering for the presence of God. You're hungering for the people of God. You're, you're just looking for the opportunity to get together in his presence just one more time because miracles happen in a room just like this and souls get turned around in a room just like this. Eternities get identified and changed. Heaven becomes some Somebody's eternal hope because that happens in a room just like this when God begins to move among his people in his house in his tabernacles there is power released ah. I get hungry for that I'll just tell you that, that I, I, I just don't like going very many any many days without being in the presence of God with God's people we need that. And, and so this morning, if this is one of your first times, we get a little loud, we get a little excited, and we, we even have fun. I know maybe church shouldn't be that way. We even have a little bit of fun sometimes. And, but can I tell you that there is something very definite that you need here in this room this morning. 
It's the power of God and it's the presence of God. And, and no wonder the psalmist, when he picked one of 11 songs to sing, he said, I, I think this is, and God ordained it, this is a song that, that needs to be sung. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Uh, it, it said in verse 3 that the sparrow hath found in house and the swallow a nest for herself where she, lay, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. The birds got nests, but, but there's something about humanity that God's house is a place of refuge for us. The same way that that bird finds its way back to its nest. It's, it's where it, it raises its young. It's where it lays its eggs. It's that place of comfort. It's that place of safety when the storm's blowing and the, and the trees are just kind of swaying back and forth. That, that bird knows where to find its nest. Can I tell you that this is like that for somebody here this morning? And it can be like that for you in the time of trouble. God said he would hide us in his pavilion. God said this place, this house of worship is an opportunity for us to experience the power and the presence of God together. We need this place together because we have this thing called life that we've all got to walk through. And in that journey, we get thirsty for not just natural water, but a supernatural water. There is a supernatural well that God has available for us in the most difficult seasons of our life. That's why David said in Psalm 42, he said, a heart, as a heart panteth after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. Why? Because it can get dry out there. Life can get hard and difficult. I, I'm just building a frame, framework. We're, we'll get there and, and then we'll, <clears throat> we'll move on quickly as, unless God just kind of slows everything up. But, but, but there's something powerful about ready to happen in the room if someone would just get ready to receive what God wants to give into your life. Verse 42, <clears throat> chapter 42, verse 2 of that psalm, he said, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The valley... The valley is a synonym for situations in our life that are perplexing and cause us to wonder what's happening, what's happening around us or what's happening to us, what's happening with, with the people that we're connected to. Why are we walking through this valley? And, and the psalmist in this chapter said that that valley was the valley of Baca. It's the valley of weeping. He defined it. He said it's a season of sorrow. He said the rain comes and it fills the pool, but, but there's just something about, about those times that when you're passing through those valleys that it can get very troublesome. It can get difficult. And, and, uh, and so, yes, we celebrate. The, the reason why church is, is so meaningful to us is because we can come together and we can look around and we can say, you know what, I know that that person has walked a very difficult road, but God has been good to them. And so we can identify in our lives that God is going to be good to us. He's no respecter of persons. If God's done that for them, then he will do it for me. And, and something powerful happens in this exchange. We need each other. We need each other. I, we talked about it on Wednesday night. Uh, I need you. Just tap your neighbor and say, I need you. I need you. And, and so sometimes when we're walking through life, it becomes that valley, that, that very valley that the psalmist was speaking about, a valley. It was a valley in Palestine. And and. and we don't have to look far, just a few seats to the side to find someone that has walked through a valley of weeping. We don't have to look far ahead or far behind us that, that, that you can find someone that has had a difficult season in their life. You know those times in your life when a circumstance overcomes you and, and it just steals and saps everything out from the inside? that season of life, that difficult time. The Bible, uh, the, the psalmist said that they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Everyone goes through a season like that. A season of the from strength season. When none of us have, uh, have the strength to carry on. It's a, it's a from strength. We, have, we were strong, but now we feel Weak. We were powerful, but now we feel powerless. You know what it's like to go from strength, don't you? Let me, let me just bring a few reminders. It, it came in the form of, of a pink slip or a bad report. It came in the form of a call that you thought you would never get. It came in the form of family falling apart or your children walking away. Demas forsook you. Your brook dried up. How many 
analogies can we bring to the table? Your mule barrel is empty. Your vial of oil has only a drop left in it. You're battling or battled depression. You lost a job. You lost a friend. You lost your health. You lost, you felt like you lost your mind. A valley. Does anyone know what I'm talking about, valley? Maybe you're in the middle of it right now, but can I, can just, just for the sake of Identity. Can someone raise their hand and say, I've been in a valley before. I've been there. It's called from strength. The mountaintop is over there and now you're in the valley. But the psalmist didn't stop there. He didn't say from strength to the end. He said from strength to strength. And if you'd never went from strength, you'd never have experienced the strength that you could find in the middle of the valley of Baca. The valley of weeping. There's strength there. 2 Corinthians says that, he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My strength is made perfect in weakness and we read it on cups and have it on chalkboards and strength made perfect in weakness but the reality is is that when we leave that place from strength is the only time that we can find perfect strength. Hebrews talks about it, speaks of weakness without hesitation and it's the hero story, it's the chapter 11 Uh, Heroes of faith, he said, what shall I say more? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel and prophets, and who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. But listen, all of those things identify under one heading, out of weakness, out of weakness, were made Strong. From strength allows us the opportunity to walk into a brand new strength. And that promise comes in difficult seasons, in difficult places. It comes on tear stained carpets and couches. It comes when you need to reach way back to a promise that God has given you weeks, months, years, decades earlier back to the promise of when you were in a place of strength but now you have left from strength and you're on your way to strength and there are things that you can do in that season that God encourages us and shows us and allows us to realize through his word I'm just just talking to, to people in the room that it's difficult right now we we've heard the the songs uh encouraged us and strengthened us but but can we just let the word do that work for a few moments because that's a dangerous place to be in people get sidetracked when they leave those places of strength because it feels like you're there all alone in genesis 21 is the story haggard she didn't do anything wrong she just did what she was told she had served faithfully But now she was shunned and sent away. Abraham rose, took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar. You can read this between verses 14 and 19 of Genesis 21. He sent her away and she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. The water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs and she sat down a good way off, scripture says. And she said, let me not see the death of the child. It was the end. It was that season from strength. Everything had been going so perfect until... And she lifted up her voice and wept. And it says that God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and show him thine hand, for I will make of him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. There are times in that season of sorrow, in that valley of Baca, that you don't know where to turn and you don't know what to do. And it's just, you you, you think the last drop is gone. I'm finished. I have nothing to satisfy 
the hunger or the thirst in my life anymore. And it's in sometimes in that moment that God does the miraculous and he shows us a well. It's a miraculous well. It's God opens her eyes and she sees the well of water. Missed it for whatever reason, whether God created it in that moment for her or whether it was just invisible to her until she cried out or until the lad cried out. But it was in that moment that she saw the well and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. Sometimes it's a miracle that God does in that moment. Sometimes, and I'm thanking God for miracles like that. Miracles that when you're walking through that valley of weeping and that valley of sorrow, a supernatural strength comes that you couldn't identify before. You couldn't see see it on the horizon, but God showed up and allowed you to walk through it. I'm thanking God for miracles that happened like that, where it didn't look like I had a hope, but God said, hang on just a minute. Let me open your eyes so you can see clearly. Like Elijah with his servant said, open his eyes so he can see. And then all of a sudden the armies of God were all encamped around about them. Sometimes God just shows us the miraculous sign. He opens it in a miraculous way. And I love them. I love the miracles. But then there's other times when the psalmist said, it's not a miracle, but you've got to make it a well. It's something that you've got to do. You've got to turn your life back in the direction that it needs to be. And it may be, maybe you're in that place because of a choice that you've made and you didn't even realize it was the wrong way. You didn't pray the right prayer. You didn't, you didn't ask the right thing. You didn't ask for direction. And now all of a sudden you found yourself in that place. Can I tell you that God, sometimes he, he does the miraculous work, but then other times God says, hey, it's time to make a well in the middle of that mess that you've got, that, that you found yourself into. It's time to make a well. And, and the Bible balances that out. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's just faith, but then it's faith by your works. Sometimes it's just a belief, but then God says, show me, put wheels under your belief for me. Put some action behind what you, what you say you believe. Put some action behind it. And there are times when God does the miraculous work, but then there's other times when God says, it's time to get the shovel out because you've got to make it a well. You've got, you've got some action that you need to, to act on. You've got some activity that you've got to get undertaking. And, and, and it's time to pick the shovel up and in the middle of that experience, begin to dig out a well. Dig a well. Anybody dug a well here in the room? I'm going to guess anybody my age and under, no. You know what we do? We call Sullivan's well drilling. The big massive truck rolls in, stands that ladder vertically and starts pounding the soil. <laughs> but if you go back a generation or two, wells were dug. They say, that, uh, they say that women look for something in their future husbands that reminds them or identifies them with their father. I don't know what, <laughs> I love my father-in-law, but I'm, and, and I am an awful lot like him. His last name means in, industrious or ingenious, uh, ingenuity, Tracy. And uh, he, he's a, an ingenious little guy. He, uh, he, he doesn't just have one well. Well, he's got three wells and the city. He's got one at his house. He's got a well that he's dug there at, at his home, and, and he, he dug it by hand. That's the well that he's got. He, and then if you were to go to his camp, he, he had sourced a spring up on the hill. So in the summertime, when you're at his camp, you can turn the faucet on, and the water's going to run just like, just like home because he's got... Uh, a pipe that he's got laid and kind of covered up and it runs all the way up the hillside to the spring that feeds this little pond. And I've been up there with him. We'll go up in the, in the spring and I say we like I've done this all the time. I have been there before. I can't remember maybe once or twice, but there in the spring and, and he's gone up and he's pulled all the leaves out that may have fallen in that little spring and it's a, it's a, a little cistern and, and he's got a hose that runs into that and it goes, runs down the hillside and he, he's explained it all to me. Jack, if you start with a, a two inch line and, and, and you, you bring it down so far and then you, you bring that down to one inch line and, and keep that running and then, then when you get to the, the camp, then it, it, it breaks down to a half inch line. You bring that inside and man, you get some good pressure because that two inch line, it's going it's gonna to have a lot more water and weight and that's going to push that one I've got it all doo -doo -doo -doo. I've got that all figured out it's he's he's got it all figured out I've got it all figured out and then there's three camps on the point and he's got water lines run to all those camps and and they've got without any pump they've got water all summer long but Terry wasn't happy with that because in the winter he likes to 
get in his little Jeep and drive up on the ice when the ice goes in and he gets in there. And, but the problem is you can't leave that water, the spring-fed water line, open in the wintertime. It's going to bust and break and you've got to empty that all out. And so he, for a few years, he, in behind his camp, he, and this is where I don't know if the part of me that Kathy was attracted to And it maybe it scares me a little bit that maybe that's true. Because <laughs> this camp, it's very rustic. I'll use that word, rustic. Some would say redneck. I'll say rustic. <laughs> and uh, in behind the camp, he's got <clears throat> some windows that somebody's thrown away, and that becomes the framework for the walls. And then an old door that someone threw away, and a screen door on that. And, and you open that little door, and you go inside, and you lift up this lid. And, no, I'm not talking about the outhouse. This is well number three. And years ago, he, he said, man, it was hard digging. I dig for a couple hours every day. And it, it, it didn't take days. It didn't take like an afternoon. It was weeks of digging in that. He called it hard pan. I don't know what hard pan is. It tells you how much I helped him digging. It's just, he said, when I, he said, I, I dug down through and he said, finally, I hit the vein of water. And he said, then I had to dig it out. Man, that, he said, that water is so cold. And he said, I just keep digging and working at it. And he said, finally, I got the well. And, and now you can go up there. And it, it, well, here's my point. It didn't come easy. It was not just like a few hours of work. And it wasn't an excavator that somebody drove in there. It was all just uh, a pick and a shovel. He said, I would hammer it with the pick. And then I'd get in there with the shovel. And I'd get a little shovel full, just a little shovel full. And I said, I'd dig that out. And, and he said, after time, he said, I finally got it down. We were at the water level. And then I kept digging because I got to have some capacity in the well. And, and now when you go up there, and what I take so much for granted when I just drop that pail in, and maybe in the middle of the winter, and I drop that pail in, and I hear it hit the, hit the water, just poof, and you wait, and you bring it back up, and it's this ice cold, clear water. But it, it comes so easy to me. And I, some people say, that's not easy. You've got to go get it from the well. It's a whole lot easier than digging it out. He put the work in, and, and, I, and, and I have a level of appreciation. Now, he has a great deal of appreciation for that. Because he knows how much time it took to, to dig that well, out, to literally dig it a well. He had to make that well. He had to make it a well. And sometimes in our life, it's not going to come easy. I'm grateful for the miracles. I'm thankful for the spring on the hill that comes so easy when I just turn the spigot and it flows freely. But there's some seasons, some winter seasons in our life when God brings us to that we've got to make our own well. It's not going to come easy. It's not just going to flow. We're not just going to turn it on and it comes and all of a sudden we're satisfied and, 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 it, and it, we can't even contain all the blessings. No, sometimes you've got to make it a well. You've got to dig it out in prayer and you've got to dig it out in the word of God. You, you got a little promise box on your table because you walk through seasons like that wilderness season or that season of sorrow, that season of weeping and, and you just pull one of those scripture verses out of that little box and, or it's in your Bible app. Shows up in your Bible app, your Bible reading app, and, and that verse ministers to you. It meets a need, or somebody posts it on Twitter, or they got it on Facebook, and the word comes in the middle of your wilderness. Can I just tell you, sometimes that's where the satisfaction comes, but sometimes it's going to be you digging it out. You got to dig it out. You got to get in the word and find it. All of a sudden, you get into that season, and, and, and the word will begin to speak to you. And it doesn't come easy. You've got to you got to dig it out by yourself. It's a, a lot of work. It's some labor of love, and it's some labor that happens. But when you're in that season, from strength on your way to strength, if you will make it a well, God will follow through on His promise. And all of a sudden, what was weeping will turn to joy. What was sorrow will turn to celebration. All because you're willing to make it a well. And sometimes. I'm grateful for the miracles, but I'm encouraging somebody. If it's not coming all that easy for you, come get the shovel of the Holy Ghost out and begin to dig something out in your spirit and God will satisfy the need in your life. As we're coming back to the music, I must say going back to the water this morning. That was some good singing today. And not just Kathy, I mean in all of it. Sometimes you've got to dig it out. Oh, Genesis 26, it said that Isaac had to dig again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. Sometimes we've got to dig it again. It says the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. The enemy will work to fill in your well, but dig it again. 
You say sometimes in the desert, there's no water here. Dig it again. 2 Kings 3 verse 17 talks about the time when the people of Israel called upon Elisha to entreat God on their behalf to bring water. You know what the instruction was? Make the valley full of ditches. Get digging. Yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Everyone is going to benefit from the blessing that comes into your life because you're willing to dig it again. I'm thanking God for summer seasons when the water flows freely, but in that winter season, when you're in that from strength place, I encourage you, don't quit. Don't stop. How sweet will the water be if you got in there and dug it out personally? Our spirit is thirsting. Our souls are hungry. It won't come from the world. It can't come from YouTube. It can't come from Netflix. It can't from, come from the remote control or a book in your hand. You can't, unless it's this book. Sometimes you just got to make it well. You've got to make a well in the middle of that circumstance. But if you do, then you pass from strength to strength. You'll go into it stronger because you dug it out personally. You'll go into it with certainty because God didn't fail you in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the problem. Make it a well. Just tap your neighbor and say, make it a well. The valley of bucket, of weeping, the, the, the valley of sorrow isn't there to defeat you. It's there to exalt you. In that place of humility, First Peter said, humble yourselves under the hand of a mighty God that he may exalt you in due time. That place of humility brings about an opportunity for God to do the miraculous. The woman at the well, I'll close there. You can stand. I won't be long. She came thirsty. Uh, a search party of two. One headed one way and one headed the other. Jesus searching for a woman. The woman searching for a well. Meet in the middle and God identifies the valley of Baca in her life. She doesn't understand it. She's got lots of questions. Are you greater than our father Jacob? How are you going to give me water? Why are you talking to me? Which well? You got nothing to draw with. How are you going to do that? And he says, if you knew who I was and what I'm offering, if you knew this water that I want to give you, it's not a water from this well that's been dug, but it's a well of water on the inside. See, that's really what this is about, that there is a water that can surface in your spirit on the inside if you dig it out in the Holy Ghost it doesn't matter what you walk through from strength on your way to strength God says keep digging because the promise is there she was digging around asking all kinds of questions but finally when she realized who it was she left her water pot at the well and went in and told the, the entire city of everything that he had said to her and done for her she traded her cup in for a well. In closing this, this morning, the Old Testament talks about the valley of weeping, the valley of sorrow. The Old Testament, it's a cup of salvation and a well of suffering. It's a cup of salvation. That's what the psalmist said. And throughout scripture, you'll find that David said, my cup runneth over. It was a cup of opportunity, a, a cup of salvation. Then the, there was just a well of suffering. Everywhere you turn, there was suffering, suffering, suffering. But in the New Testament, Jesus turned that all around because he said, let this cup of suffering pass from me. But he told the woman at the well, it can be in you, a well of living water springing up inside your soul. Can I just tell you that the enemy will try and make you believe that you're in a, a well of suffering when really it's just a cup. 
And if you'll turn that cup away and identify the need for the well of living water in your life, God will meet you right where you are here this morning. I wonder if you pray together with me. We're going to sing in a moment. I'm going to invite you to come because there's something powerful about turning your back on the world, the enemy, and accepting what God has for you in store this morning. You can come as I'm praying. You can come in that moment. I I wonder if everyone would just bow their head. That may be the liberty that somebody wants to take to come to this altar and pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity for us to be together in your tabernacle. God, in this house, this modern house of worship, but God, it's a well of opportunity. I pray that somebody, God, would be satisfied what the world couldn't do in bringing contentment, God, you want to do in a moment this morning in somebody's spirit. You want something to spring up. It was Israel's song that they cried out, spring up a well. It's a song that we have in this room this morning. Spring up, oh well. Spring up in the middle of barren places. Spring up in the middle of difficult seasons. Spring up in the midst of impossibilities. God, we pray today that you would spring up in somebody's life. God, they're digging it out. They're just kind of pushing sin to the side. They're turning their life back toward you. They they may not even know. They may not even know all the steps that they've got to take. But here's what they know. That the world can't satisfy the need that they have in their spirit. So... God, I pray that this altar would be a place of transformation. God, I pray that this, the front of this sanctuary would become, God, somebody's transition point from strength to strength. That in that moment, God, that they come to turn it all over to you. God, that you will bring a well into their life. Work the way that you work, God. We pray this morning. God, we pray that joy would come in sorrow, strength in the midst of weakness. We give you praise in advance of every promise you're going to give us today. One more time. Well, I wonder if we did, would you just lift both hands or maybe someone else that did, you're just going to say, I, I'm going to come together with the church family. Church, I'm going to ask that you'll come as we begin to sing and just find someone to pray with that God would strengthen. You don't know what season someone's walking through right now. My soul.